Hello to Leeds LGBT Book Club and Leeds LGBT Plus Literature Festival. My name is Laura Kate Dale, I am 29 years old, I have been a full-time writer for the last six and a half years, near enough, coming up on seven years now. I mainly write about video games, that's a lot of my bread and butter, but I also write about being an autistic trans woman. Uh, I have some published books that already are out, and one that is coming out soon that I'm going to tell you about in a second. So, um, books I already have published. I have a book called Uncomfortable Labels, which is a book about living at the intersection of being autistic and trans. It's something that doesn't get talked about nearly often enough, but is a really common intersection. If you are an autistic person, you are eight to ten times more likely than the general population to be trans, and vice versa. And I can't tell you why that's the case, but I can tell you that there's a lot of overlap and a lot of ways that those two ways a person can be intersect. So I write a book about it in which I talk about things like it being really uncomfortable to shave or to wear makeup because of sensory oversensitivity, or some of the difficulty that I had finding clothes or learning to hold myself in ways that would be read in the way that I wanted them to in terms of gender. Basically, going through the experience of being an autistic trans woman. That book's out now, it's available uh, through Jessica Kingsley Publishers or as an audiobook on laurakbuzzstore.com. I also have another book which is much less LGBT related, but I'll mention it here. I wrote a book called Things I Learned From Mario's Butt. It's about video game character buttocks. It's a big coffee table book, it's got a bunch of pictures of video game character butts illustrated in it game developers talking about why they made butts the way they did. And then I have another book, which is coming out on June 10th, 2021, which is right around now. I know that this is airing... Oh! Ah, this... It is already out. I, I definitely know when this talk is happening. I'm doing this talk earlier in the year, ready for this. So, uh, June 10th, 2021, released a book called Gender Euphoria. I don't have the final cover version here, but I have essentially a finished version. Um, the book is an anthology of non-cis people's positive gender-affirming stories. I started writing this book in the summer of 2020. Um, I live in the UK, and anti-trans stories in the news were at an all-time high. Um, everyone was a bit depressed because of the lockdown, and things like the right to protest was being suppressed, and it was a bit of a worrying time to be a trans person in the UK, and after being really, really overwhelmed by the amount of negative stories that were happening in the world, I knew I needed to immerse myself in some trans positivity, and spending two months working on an anthology of getting to read a bunch of people's really positive, lovely stories was a good excuse for me to focus on something happy and trans-related when I needed it, and I pushed that I really wanted to get it written and edited and out within a year because I could re I, I really felt like people needed some positivity because all too often the only reason in the last year that trans people have been discussed in wider cultural discussions is because some attempt to roll back our rights is happening, and it's important we talk about that, it's important we deal with attacks on our ability to live our lives, but it can be really easy to forget that non-cis people's stories can be positive, can be affirming, can be lovely. I know that when I wrote my first book, uh, Uncomfortable Labels, I fell into a trap that I know a lot of people do. Um, I talked about my story of my transition largely through the lens of dysphoria. I largely talked about it through a lens of I was uncomfortable with how my body was changing, I was uncomfortable with how people saw me, I felt a disconnect, I didn't feel happy with my birth assigned gender, so I transitioned. It's an easy to palatably bring over to people's story. It's a story that's really easy for people to understand, it's a 
you know, it's very easy to explain to someone something felt uncomfortable and bad and therefore I wanted to fix it. But so often stories of transition are about more than that. Dysphoria is not an inherent thing that you need to have to be valid as a trans person. It is just as valid to transition because being validated as your gender brings you euphoria. You might be just fine the way that you were born, but someone calls you a different set of pronouns and suddenly you go, that made me really happy, I really liked that. And that's just as valid a reason to transition as I dislike something about me now and I want to get away from that. Um, so yeah, Gender Euphoria is a book entirely of various non-cis people's positive gender affirming stories. It's a book of people telling stories of how their coming out and their journey as a trans person had joyful moments, had uplifting moments, had things that made them feel validated. It's a book that tries to remind us all that transition can be a beautiful, happy, wonderful, lovely thing, and that behind all of the fighting to keep our rights intact, there's just getting to live really happy, lovely, authentic lives, and that's something I know I needed to focus on. So today I'm going to be doing a little bit of a reading from this book, and then I will be doing a little bit of talking about how the book came to be and what the situation with it is. Um, a little background, I have written about a third of the content in the book. It is a book made up largely of smaller essays, so every couple of contributor essays then there'll be one from me. Um, but I tried very hard to make sure that this book contained a wide variety of different people's perspectives. I didn't want this to be another book of binary trans people from England and the USA's accounts of their transitions. I wanted this to be more than that. So across the 15 to 20 contributors that we have in here, I tried to make sure that we had a good balance of trans men, trans women, non-binary people, agender, gender fluid, lots of different gender identity backgrounds. Um, I wanted to make sure that we had a good number of people who were not white, that we had a good percentage of the book that was disabled writers. I wanted to make sure that we had uh, a good percentage of writers that were from countries that were not the UK or the US, basically to try and give a wider sense of the different things that gender euphoria can mean to different people with different experiences. Um, so. I'm going to read the foreword, and then I'm going to read a sample from the book. So often, when we see pop culture portrayals of trans and non-cisgender people's lives, hear stories shared by trans people about their transitions, or accounts by the media about trans people and their transitions, those stories focus on misery and discomfort. It makes sense why this happens. For many transgender people, a big part of what initially pushes us to realise we need to come out is experiencing gender dysphoria, an unpleasant feeling of disconnect between our gender assigned at birth and our knowledge of our own lived experience. Maybe you hit puberty and start growing facial hair, or your voice drops, or you start growing breasts, and suddenly you feel uncomfortable, like the changes happening to your body are alien, are transforming you into something you don't want to be. All those quietly held thoughts about not being your birth assigned gender you might have grown up with suddenly have a focal point. Your body's changing, and you don't like what it's becoming. Not every trans person experiences dysphoria, and it's certainly not required to be valid as a trans person, but there's a reason it gets talked about so often, and that it's used as part of the diagnostic criteria. It's quite often what kicks a person from spending years thinking, it sure would be nice to be a different gender from the one I was assigned at birth, into actually deciding to make a change in who they want to live as. Gender dysphoria is a catalyst. It lights a fire under many, and underscores the aspects of themselves they're unhappy living with. Trans people all around the world today, to greater or lesser degrees, are still fighting for legal recognition of their gender status, legal protections, rights, and safety. When it comes to explaining why you need the right to live the way you do, that you feel uncomfortable with yourself, that you need to alleviate a pain deeply lodged in you, that's easy to explain quickly and easily. 
Everyone's been hurt emotionally in their lives, and it's easy to understand why you'd want to take steps to avoid discomfort. Beyond that, even the media plays a part in that framing of the trans narrative. If you want people to feel sympathy for the trans community, explain we're escaping dysphoria. If you want to demonise the community, tell people our dysphoria is a delusion and shouldn't be indulged. It can be spun differently depending who's trying to spin it, which makes it a powerful aspect to the way trans stories are so often portrayed. I know I, as a trans person, fall into this trap sometimes when discussing my own transition. When I wrote my memoir a few years ago, sure, it touched on some positives and some joyful moments, but that certainly wasn't the focus. I wrote a lot about not fitting in growing up, about struggling to be accepted when I came out, and I wrote about the challenges I'm facing in the world today. It made sense to share those parts of my story with the world, but it also got me thinking about how prevalent that narrative can be when discussing trans stories. Over the couple of years since then, I've thought a lot about the importance of celebrating the fact that stories of transition are not all just about doom and gloom, as much as it may sometimes feel that way. I've experienced countless moments of elation, pride, confidence, freedom and ecstasy as a direct result of my coming out as a trans woman the better part of a decade ago. And I know I'm not alone. When I talk to my trans, non-binary, agender, gender fluid and intersex friends, I've heard countless wonderful stories about the way that coming to terms with gender brought unimaginable happiness and love into their lives. When I said earlier that gender dysphoria isn't a required part of being trans, I meant it. When I say that, sometimes people ask me how someone would know they were trans if not for feeling uncomfortable with their body and the way they were born. And to that, I say the answer's simple. If you try presenting yourself as something other than your birth assigned gender, and it makes you feel euphoric, that's just as valid a reason to claim your identity as escaping dysphoria. Gender euphoria is an equally valid reason to decide who you are. I'm not going to pretend that the world isn't sometimes a bit miserable for non-cisgender people. I'm not going to pretend that a lot of us didn't have a rough road to get where we are now. But this book isn't about that. This book is about gender euphoria. This book is about people doing small actions and grand gestures that made them feel radiantly themselves and wonderfully at peace. This book is about stories of transition as euphoria. So, before we go any further, who am I? Well, my name is Laura Kate Dale. I'm a 29-year-old pansexual trans woman, author of three books, full-time video game critic and podcaster. Of the essays contained in this anthology, I wrote around one-third of them, with the rest being written by a wonderful list of contributing authors. Over the next 70,000 words or so, you'll read several essays about my own experiences with gender euphoria over the past decade, but you'll also read essays from a vast array of non-cisgender writers of different orientations and backgrounds, with a varied selection of experiences to share. Every author handpicked to contribute an essay to this anthology was selected above hundreds of other writers, because I felt they had a uniquely joyful story to tell, and was excited to help them tell that story to the world. From an agender dominatrix getting called daddy, to an Arab trans man getting his first tattoos in spite of cultural taboo, a non-binary intersex writer not having to choose between puberties, and a trans woman embracing her inner fighter, this book will take you on a journey through how coming to terms with who you are can be about more than avoiding someone you don't want to be. So thank you for picking up this book, I hope you feel as overjoyed reading it as I've felt having the privilege to put it together. I'm going to read one of my essays from this book, um, rather than reading one of my contributors' essays. I think you should check the book out if you want to hear those. But uh, this is Loving My Deep Voice's Performance Rather Than Default. As a trans woman, the first time I really thought about my voice was when I started undergoing testosterone-based puberty in my teens. Growing up, my voice had always been just sort of a background aspect of my life, something I really didn't give much consideration. It was a baseline. It was familiar. It wasn't gendered in any way that really drew my attention, or that of anyone around me. It was the only voice I'd ever had, and it was mine. That obviously changed when testosterone invited itself into my life. My voice dropped pretty hard pretty fast, and to put it lightly, I was not a fan. My voice felt pretty alien to me, and it was a pretty big source of early dysphoria during puberty. 
When I would speak, it felt like picking a dialogue option in a video game and hearing someone else's voice lines play. There was a level of disconnect between my voice and my sense of self. Now, I'm going to take a break from reading this to uh, 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 try and I mean, get my voice sort of... This is where my voice used to be. It's sort of down down here. Uh, it's very strange to watch myself do this. It uh, doesn't does not look right coming out of my mouth. Ah, there we go. I shall continue reading with that context. When I think about the dysphoria I felt around my voice dropping, a lot of it centred around how that new voice applied to my internal sense of self. It wasn't my voice, it didn't feel like me, and as a result I did my best to push it away and pretend it didn't exist. I spent years working on gently raising my vocal pitch, making an effort to learn how to get my voice to naturally sit somewhere that felt more gender affirming. Day to day, my speaking voice needed to be something that felt inherently me, like it wasn't a character whose voice I was making use of. However, this story at its core isn't about my struggles with disliking the deeper end of my vocal range. It's about how, over the last few years, I've come to love that voice again, by getting some distance from it and seeing it for the performance that it is. It was 2017, around seven or eight years after I first started coming out to my family and friends as trans. I'd spent enough of the previous decade working on changing my voice, and a fairly big percentage of people in my life who'd not known me pre-puberty had no real scale for how much my voice had changed between it initially dropping and me making attempts to bring its pitch back up. I knew the changes were pretty major, thanks to old recordings of myself on the computer, but the changes had been gradual enough that a lot of people who heard my voice regularly hadn't really noticed the changes as they happened. I'd also been podcasting weekly for several years at this point, and my voice was apparently in the sort of space that I wanted it to be, as a lot of people who listened to me on podcasts were unaware of my trans status until I opted to bring it up on my own terms. I'd found a voice I could comfortably relax into, and one I didn't feel dysphoric about. At this point in my life, dropping my voice back down to its old teenage vocal range was a bit of a party trick. I would sometimes make use of a voice around close friends. It took some effort and thought and practice, but I could get my voice to drop down to an almost caricaturishly deep register, which certainly clashed a little with my outward presentation at the time. I'd be wearing a dress and denim jacket, long hair swept across my face, and suddenly dropped my voice so it sounded like that of a bad male extra from a British soap opera. I thought it was funny. The jarring change in my voice to me was uh, pretty amusing. A sign of how far I'd come. The reactions I would get showing off my old voice were always a little bit mixed from cisgender friends and family. Some found it impressive how much my voice had changed, just as I'd hoped they might. Some found that it didn't seem to fit with my face, finding amusement in the juxtaposition between what they'd expected and what they were hearing. Some went as far as to tell me it made them uncomfortable. For those who found it uncomfortable, their reasons very much mirrored those I had when my voice first dropped. It didn't seem like it was my voice. It was unsettling hearing the wrong voice come out of my face. Hearing that others felt that way about me revisiting my old voice reminded me of a lot of baggage I had about that voice, and that stuck with me a bit. The mixed nature of reactions to my vocal party trick discouraged me for a long time from playing around in the lower end of my vocal register, but it was another trans woman my wife-to-be, Jane, author of a previous essay in this anthology, who finally helped me to find some joy, pride, and euphoria in the voices I was able to produce. I remember the morning in question really clearly. I travelled to stay with Jane, who I wasn't yet living with at the time, for a long weekend together. We had a rave we both wanted to attend in London, and we decided I would come up to hers. We'd go for the night out together, spend the following day just chilling in bed, catching up on sleep and binging TV together. A day with no set commitments, just reruns of cartoons we'd both seen before, so if one of us needed to crash out for a bit more sleep, we wouldn't miss anything too important. There were snacks on hand, a lot of cuddles to be shared, and a lot of silly chat. Now, Jane had always been a fan of doing silly voices, it was kind of her thing. She used to perform stand-up comedy, and sometimes create sketch comedy videos online, and as a result she's always been a fountain of caricaturist voices. It's one of my favourite things about her. From the drunken sherry lady, a shrill high-pitched and slightly slurred feminine voice, to the voice of an invisible weather reporter, 
Jane's regular use of exaggerated voices had never failed to bring a smile to my face. She pulled me into it too, encouraging me to try voices with her. Oh, we'd frequently slip into the sherry lady voices while cooking dinner or playing through video games together. We'd slip in and out of voices, sometimes without even meaning to. They're that big a part of our shared lives. At some point during this sleepy, cuddly morning, Jane and I got to talking about the silly voices we did, and more specifically, the voices we didn't do. Both of us had this massive part of our vocal range we didn't ever really play around with, for fear that people who were not us would respond with confusion. We had this big chunk of sounds we were capable of producing, but didn't make use of because of external perceptions. Both of us had this weird lingering fear around playing around with deep or masculine voices, and were both pretty sad about it. So, on a sleepy morning, snuggled in bed together under blankets, we started workshopping a fictional set of male friends to voice, whose personalities and vocal ranges deliberately clashed in the same sort of ways people perceived our voices and presentations to clash. They were uh, traditional British lads with uh, deep gruff voices and a love for traditionally masculine coded pursuits, but uh, a love for aspects of life not traditionally socially coded as masculine. Barry and Larry, in their grow lumbering voices, discussed how nice it can be to get a manicure done, or how they're going to uh, enjoy reading housekeeping magazines, or going out dancing with their friends. They were a pair of men who uh, personalities were masculine coded voices juxtaposed with a comfort in their masculinity that allowed them to love what they loved without fearing judgement. These characters eventually morphed over the weeks that followed, and became a pair that we now tend to refer to as the Brochal Justice Warriors. A pair of tough-as-nails British lads who care very much about improving the state of the world. Here's the thing about playing around with masculine voices. I never hated the voice testosterone gave me, I just hated that it was my everyday voice. It was an alien voice, and I didn't want it to be that voice that I used when I saw friends, or while I was at work, or on the phone. I didn't want it to be the voice that people used to understand who I was, but the voice itself wasn't inherently a bad voice. After that, the floodgates opened and we started to realise we had a bunch of other silly voices now open to us that we'd previously been missing out on. We started to play around with the voices for fake video game industry executives, game show hosts, oh, nasty old rich men with too much money and power, and a whole bunch more. We gave ourselves permission to play around with what our voices could do, free of any risk of judgement or fear that we would be seen as less inherently female for engaging with our old voices. It was incredibly liberating. Ultimately, what made this story one of gender euphoria for me was the impact it had on the rest of my relationship to my voice. For the longest time, when I was first coming out as trans, I felt a real pressure for my voice to always be as high-pitched as I could comfortably and naturally get it to go. I felt that if I wasn't doing everything possible to erase the voice that I'd once had, I wasn't being trans the right way. That's nonsense, and it took revisiting the rest of my vocal range to see that. My voice is what it is. I went through a testosterone puberty, and estrogen hormone replacement therapy isn't going to undo that. Rather than worrying that my voice still wasn't high enough, I could look at how far it had come, and use that reassuring barometer that my voice today was okay. Not pretending that part of my vocal range didn't exist, allowed me to take much greater ownership over my new day-to-day -day speaking voice. My speaking voice is my real voice, and my old voice is now what it always felt like. A performance, a character, something that isn't who I am. Separating out my old voice and assigning it to a fictional silly character I can perform really helped me to feel secure and joyous in the knowledge that my being female isn't undermined by the fact that I can make myself sound like a hired goon in a, vo in a, in a, in a heist movie, yeah. It took having another trans woman explore voices with me to open me up to the idea that my deeper vocal range could be something that I might one day love, from a safe and respectable distance. As a character voice, I love that part of my range. It's a tool in an arsenal of very silly voices that Jane and I use day to day. And just by virtue of it being a character's voice rather than mine, I can see it for what it is. A voice to be loved rather than to be scorned. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me read from this and introduce myself. Uh, once again, my name is Laura Kate Dale. I have 
um, three books out, Uncomfortable Labels, Things I Learned From Maria's Butt, and Gender Euphoria, which will have a cover that looks much lo more like that when you go and buy it, but it's out now. Uh, it released on June 10th, 2021, and I am incredibly proud of this book. Um, I am honoured that I got to have so many people bring their stories to me, and it was a real honour to be able to pay people for their work to share such wonderful, lovely stories. Um, I want to take a little bit of time before I finish up today to just give a sense of some of the stories we have in this book, because I, again, I'm very proud of all of the contributors who shared words in this. Like, today you've largely heard from me, my name is on the cover, but it's the other people in this book that have really made it what it is. Um, there is a wonderful story near the start that I wanted to highlight called My Mister's Mister by a, uh, an autistic author and trans man named Miles Nelson who talks about having a gender-affirming wedding in spite of the UK's gender recognition system and the weird arbitrary limitations placed on how someone can get married as a trans person without a GRC. Um, there is a wonderful story in here from um, a queer non-binary writer called Halo Jedda Dawn about trying to find a balance of parenting and navigating gendered aspects of parenting with another non-binary parent and how to split up that work. It's a really wonderful story. Um, there is one called The Euphoria That Lies in Revolt. Uh, Loving Myself While Living in Brazil by a 22-year-old trans woman named Julia F. Candida. Um, that is, as it sounds like, is a story of a trans woman in Brazil finding joy and love in her identity and who she is. Uh, there's a really wonderful story in here by an author called Mari Roby, a queer non-binary intersex activist uh, from California who talks about navigating puberty in a way that worked for them, that worked with their gender identity, and the ways that their body's development ended up being very validating for them and their experience of gender. Uh, and there is a wonderful story by uh, a writer called Jaden Hamid, who is a 23-year-old disabled trans man, um, talking about his relationship between his Muslim faith and his journey as a trans person. There are so many more stories in here that I have flicked through and picked a few at random because I was flicking through being like, I should tell people about some of these stories. And my urge was, oh, I could, I wanted to tell you about every one of them. They're wonderful. They're lovely. I am very proud of this book. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for taking the time to listen to be taught today. I hope you have enjoyed this and um, look out for more books from me in the future. I have a book hopefully end of this year coming out with Jessica Kingsley Publishers, which will be a children's book illustrated about trans stuff, um, tentatively titled The Dysphoria Monster. Don't know what it'll be eventually called. Might have, might have a name by the time that this airs, but um, thank you very much. It's been lovely to be a part of this LGBT literature festival. Thank you very much.